Hello, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, ISPIA Roundtable on Africa's Thorny Horn, a title that we borrowed from the report that we recently published on the Horn of Africa region. My name is Giovanni Carbone. I'm head of the Africa program at ISPI. I will introduce and moderate the discussion tonight. I want to welcome in particular our three speakers. They are Afiare Elmi, Associate Professor of Security Studies at Qatar University, David Stein, Lecturer in Politics and International Relations at Birbeck College, University of London, and Annette Weber, Senior Researcher at, uh, researcher at uh, SWP, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Thank you uh, all for accepting to contribute to the debate tonight. The way we'll go about the debate is by having three rounds of interventions by uh, each of uh, our three speakers, each time with some five minute um, interventions. Uh, then we'll take questions uh, uh, at the end of, our, um, of, of the presentations uh, from the audience. Um, so please use Facebook and YouTube uh, to um, ask these questions. Uh, only a few more um, words um, as uh, introduction to this debate. The Horn of Africa often primarily uh, means Ethiopia, as this is by far the largest and most uh, influential country uh, in the area. We recently held uh, another ESP roundtable that specifically focused on um, the, the, the war in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, uh, where Addis Ababa has intervened militarily against the resistance of regional authorities controlled by the TPLF. Today we want to broaden that and um, uh, to broaden our attention and look somewhat beyond the uh, Ethiopia, look at the horn beyond Ethiopia by focusing on Eritrea, Djibouti and Somalia. Uh, we will do that uh, without entirely losing sight of uh, Ethiopia itself, whose domestic developments uh, often significantly affect um, these uh, smaller neighbors. Um, yet Djibouti, Eritrea and Somalia, of course, they obviously have their own uh, domestic complex dynamics. And this is particularly what we want to uh, look at. Um, we want to discuss the trajectories that are being uh, followed by these three countries. And the least known uh, among these three countries, uh, I, I would guess um, um, in, in our audience uh, is Djibouti. And this is why I want to uh, start uh, from, from it. David Stein, uh, lecturer in politics and international relations uh, at Birbeck College. Um, I'd like you to tell us something about this very, or, or at least relatively tiny, uh, African country. What type of country is it? And why is it that such a small country is increasingly making its mark uh, on the geopolitical map? David. Giovanni, thanks very much. Uh, I send greetings from London where it's just getting dark. Um, so Djibouti is paradoxical in that, as you say, most people don't know much about it. It's by far the smallest uh, state in the Horn. And yet it is incredibly important internationally. Um, so a few basic points uh, in relation to Djibouti. I mean, it's often referred to as a micro state um, or indeed a city state, neither of which is entirely true. Um, it does have a fairly large land mass I mean, it's about the same size as Tuscany uh, for your Italian listeners. And it's bigger than Israel or Slovenia or several of the Emirates, for example. Um, but it does have a very small population. It's around a million people. And the overwhelming majority of the population lives in Djiboutiville, the main town, which is both residence, capital city, and a port city with several important um, ports. But the state itself does have a hinterland, and that hinterland has been used above all by outsiders for military exercises, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but in terms of domestic issues, not only is the population very small, but also um, really it is a state and political system that runs entirely on patronage with a very small uh, actually very we wealthy and clearly very politically agile and intelligent uh, elite and, and leadership. So the president of Djibouti has been in power um, for over 20 years and is about to go into his uh, um, 
fifth presidential term. Indeed, this afternoon in Djibouti, there's a very large rally of young people in the main stadium, which uh, is, is kind of part of the pre-election uh, preparations. Um, it's also a very open state. It's a cosmopolitan state. It shares uh, populations with uh, not only Eritrea and Somalia that we'll discuss this evening, but also Ethiopia uh, in terms of it, both of its main components of Somali speakers and uh, Afar speakers who are found in both Eritrea and Ethiopia. But it's particularly prominent in the region and internationally uh, because of its location, its geostrategic location on the Bab al Mandab entry to the Red Sea between the Gulf of Aden and Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. And it is for that reason that there is such a significant foreign presence. Obviously, initially, France as the former colonial power, it still has its largest uh, military base in Africa in Djibouti, but also the United States. Uh, the European Union has its anti-piracy uh, patrols uh, on a rotating uh, basis. Uh, Italy has been heading that uh, on several occasions over the last 12 years that it's been in existence, but also a Japanese naval base. And as some of your listeners may know, um, now a Chinese uh, naval base, the first overseas uh, base that China has established. So for those reasons and that unique configuration of external military power, uh, Djibouti is very prominent. I guess the only other thing I'd say in introduction is that uh, Djibouti is both of the Horn of Africa, but also is a kind of bridge or linking state to the Middle East as well. Djibouti is uh, a very active member of the Arab League. It maintains its relationships with a range of uh, Middle Eastern states, Arab as well as Turkey and Iran. Um, and obviously it's also francophone, so it's also an active member of la francophonie. Uh, and so it has a diplomatic clout that goes beyond that of um, many other African states. Um, so yeah, those are some of the basic introductory points in terms of its influence. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Um, let, let's move to um, Somalia. Afiare, Afiare Elmi uh, from the Qatar University um, con also contributed a, a chapter on Somalia uh, in the report that uh, I just mentioned, which is a report that you can uh, freely download from the ISPI website, website uh, titled uh, Africa's Thorny Horn. Um, Afiare, I'd like to ask you uh, uh, also a, a short introduction to the current situation in Somalia. Uh, Somalia has long been associated with, with the collapse of its central authority uh, since the 1990s. What is the current situation in terms of rebuilding uh, uh, basic uh, state uh, infrastructures? Um, and connected to this, of course, what are the other actors that are still active uh, on the um, uh, former Somalia territory, uh, including uh, in Somaliland uh, and uh, uh, of course, with regard to the, those active in the southern part of the country, the, the Al-Shabaab jihadists. Afiara, please. Thank you so much, uh, Giovanni, and thank you to S uh, SP for this timely uh, uh, event. Uh, second, I wanted just to know that the paper that I'm about to present is a collaborative project. Dr. Abdi Hersi and I have co-authored the paper uh, and for those of you that have not read the study yet, uh, our paper is on uh, the question that you have asked, which is building, uh, I mean, state building project in Somalia, and particularly the role of the Middle Eastern and regional actors. The main argument actually that we're advancing here is that the state building project in Somalia is at best slow, if not stagnant. That's the overall argument that we were trying just uh, to uh, to present it to the uh, readers of the paper. So in terms of the question that you have asked, uh, I'll just uh, touch on the state of the uh, current situation in terms of politics, in terms of security, and in terms of economy uh, for the five minutes that I have. Uh, politically, the country is divided uh, in many ways. Actually, if you look at in terms of the territorially, you have uh, Somalia, Somaliland that are uh, 
I mean, having problems with respect to whether we should have one or more state, but there are more to it here in terms of the number of constitutions that are operating. We also have a number of federal member states in Somalia. And when you look each constitution, like you're talking about seven or eight constitutions in Somalia, each con you, you'll see like how these, I mean, contradict each other and what kind of, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, state instruments that they have in mind. And when you look at it, there is one conclusion that uh, you can make out of that, which is that the essence of the Somali state is, is still contested. So that is uh, the politics side of things. Second, uh, in terms of divisions, uh, it's not only Somaliland, Somalia, and it's not only federal member states and the federal government of Somalia, but also the country is divided along, I mean, insurgency and those who are, I mean, governments, all of them, whether, whether they are in the North or in the South. And here you have Al-Shabaab and Daesh on one side, and then you have also uh, the number of administrations that we have. So literally the country is, is divided in many ways. In terms of security, uh, obviously when you have that many administrations, you also have, uh, I mean, uh, a number of, clan militias that are representing each uh, territorial unit there. But also we have Al-Shabaab, which is Al-Shabaab and Daesh, or and, and the Islamic State that are more or less uh, threatening the uh, administrations that existed there. And the, and the other, perhaps one of the most important security related issue that the state building project is facing is rebuilding professional army in Somalia. We're not going uh, uh, as fast as uh, many people would like in terms of this. We have here and there like Turkey contributing and others and uh, some progress, but it's like one step forward, uh, two backward, more or less. In terms of economy, while there has been progress in reconstituting the central bank and there is some development in terms of the debt relief, the government has achieved little uh, when it comes to the reducing poverty or unemployment, when it comes to resolving the currency crisis. Just a few days ago, we were having some demonstrations on this issue. And finally, uh, we had uh, uh, Somalia has an issue of raising government revenues in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, w w the, 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 the base, the revenue base it has. Uh, just to give you an example, we had about $650 million budget for 2020, the revised budget. And that revised budget, Somalia actually contributed, or the Somali sources contributed to about 29% or about 30% of it. The rest is just coming from the international community. Uh, so overall, in terms of the state building project, I would say that uh, it's uh, very slow, uh, very messy, uh, and uh, the progress is, is, is really, really not, not that good, and particularly, the political front is, is, is having the biggest impact. I want to stop there and I'll, I'll wait uh, other questions, Shah. Thank you, Afiara. Let me just ask you uh, briefly uh, a short clarification because I'm not sure I got this right. When you mentioned the several constitutions that are there, uh, you refer to constitutions uh, that each of the federated regions uh, adopted. Is, is, is that correct? So well, the regional um, statutes, or, or, or is it at a uh, national level? I was not clear, sorry. Well, uh, when you look at Somali Republic, that was born in 1960, uh, that territorial unit, uh, we have, uh, first of all, Somalia and Somaliland, if you just will. Uh, the Mogadishu uh, government claims, or at least uh, says that it represents the whole country, but in reality, you have Somaliland, which is more or less pursuing secessionist agenda. But even after that, when you come to the Somali, uh, the so-called federal government of Somalia, if you look the constitution is that these federal member states have, and look at particularly the, uh, the founding principles of each, uh, you would see that it's more than federation. Some of them are pursuing uh, either a confederal or even an independent state project. So when you look, I mean, even though rhetorically they might be saying something different, when you look at the, uh, even by the way, uh, of the five member states, four of them were born 
after uh, the Somali constitution was uh, enacted in 2012, yet their constitutions are not in line with the federal constitution of Somalia. So here there is a big mess when it comes to the founding document Thank you. of each unit of the country. Okay, thank you, Afyar. Uh, we had two very good introductions by David and Afyar. Annette, now to you, uh, Eritrea. Annette Weber, senior researcher at uh, SWP, as I say, Germany Institute for International and Security Affairs. Eritrea is very frequently described as Africa's North Korea. Um, it is, and it, I would say it is certainly a rather seclusive country. Uh, can you tell us uh, you know, what kind of political regime, political system it has and uh, which direction is it evolving, if any? Um, Giovanni, thank you so much. I would say also the country and the, the leadership um, is basically in stasis. There is no movement. Um, but the international perception of Eritrea is a total up and down. So there is a lot of change. I would say we come from the beginning of the independence of Eritrea in 91, where the president Isaias Afwerki came in as the, the leader of uh, the independence move me, movement. Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm and, and will, willingness for change and building up this very new country. It became a new country then. Um, and that changed very quickly after the, the first or the second war, then um, the, the war against neighboring Ethiopia in, in uh, 98, um, 1989, sorry, um, and, and 2000. So from this enthusiasm to, um, to a total breakdown, let's say, of dynamics, of political dynamics. So from, from the beginning on, we never had an election. Um, there is no parliament. There is no independent uh, judiciary. There is no independent media. And the opposition or the internal critique, basically, against President Isaias Afwerki uh, from his own cabinet, from his own members of um, of the of the party of the movement um, basically led to to imprisonment for for most of these members of um, of the inner circle and for the others to leave the country so we have we had a lot of uh, enthusiasm in the beginning and then since basically uh, 2000 there is nothing really moving however what is moving moving is um is the perception and and why is this perception changing and i would i would say it's really from a spoiler to to an architect that we see um ethiopia uh, eritrea and, and specifically president <coughs> afwerki um coming in right now and i think you know after after the war with Ethiopia, um, there was a lot of isolation and, and self-isolation. Um, you know, the, the border was um, was basically secured by the by the United Nations. The United Nations was kicked out. Uh, NGOs were were um, left or had to leave the country. So there was a lot of isolation in the pariah state. And then came a change, and basically the change came in two or three ways, let's say. A change came with the with the recognition of the Europeans in terms of migration. Um, because a lot, a huge number in, in I think in Italy by itself, 25% maybe of, of migrants um, coming from Eritrea. And again, you know, this is a country in a region where you have a lot of um, conflict and war in South Sudan and Somalia, um, but you don't have a war in Eritrea, but the highest number of people coming from this or reaching Europe from, from this region are coming from Eritrea. And it is because it's a very dictatorial, very, very close state uh, where you can't leave, where you have to undergo national service um, and where basically the understanding for Eritrea and the, the rationale for the, the, the raison d'etre for, for the state was um, to be prepared to fight the, the attack or the, the perceived attack that could come any moment uh, from neighboring Ethiopia. Now that has, you know, the, the migration has changed um, the, the, the Europeans position because they felt they need to engage with uh, Eritrea. Uh, the war in Yemen has changed uh, the, the position on Eritrea from the Gulf states uh, who so far had not really been dealing with, uh, with Eritrea or rather um, pre uh, President Afwerki didn't want to deal with the, with the UAE and, and, the, and the Saudis. Um, 
but that has changed because uh, the UAE has basically two naval bases or specifically one main naval base in Assab from where um, the war in Yemen is, is fought and also the war in or the, the UAE, the Emirati part of the war in, in Libya uh, is, be, is being fought. So Eritrea became extremely important in this regional um, or geopolitical uh, positioning and because of the alliance between the Americans or the US administration and the, and the Gulf states, um, also the US had much more of an interest in that Eritrea. So without changing anything, without you know, still having a terrible human rights record, still having basically nothing um, to, to, to give, neither to the population nor to, um, to the Europeans in terms of ticking boxes for you know, elections or um, democratic change or opening up of a country. Um, Eritrea managed, or rather his, the, the, the president managed to basically become an acknowledged um, partner and right now more or less becoming or turning into the architect of a regional alliance that um, I, I think I will come back to in, in, the next, in the next round. So, but I think these, these were the changes without changes in Eritrea. And um, so I, I leave it here and-, and Very clear, thank you. Thank you very the next much. Round. Thank you. So, uh, this first round helped us uh, making sense of the, 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 the key actors, the key states we're uh, talking about. And now, as I mentioned, I'd like to, um, as a first step, broaden this to uh, the issue of the relationships within uh, the Horde. Back to David. David, um, what are Djibouti's relations with Ethiopia and other uh, regional states? Uh, and what is the impact on Djibouti's, on Djibouti of uh, current regional dynamics and developments. Think uh, in particular, for example, um, also of the war in Tigray, if any. Okay, thanks Giovanni. Um, so as I said, I mean, Djibouti actually shares uh, populations or linguistic ties with uh, all of its uh, Horn of Africa neighbors. But perhaps I'd better also just mention across the sea. I mean, it's very close. You can you can see them. And, and uh, you know, there, there is a significant, uh, small but significant minority of uh, Djibouti's very cosmopolitan population that uh, Yemenis uh, or of Yemeni origin. And, and it must be said that since 2015, the war in Yemen has had quite an impact on, on, on Djibouti in several different ways. But if we turn to the Horn, let me take each of the neighboring states uh, in turn. I mean, Eritrea, it's quite a simple uh, story that uh, there really is uh, no official ties. There was actually a border war. I mean, Eritrea has had border wars of a small character with most of its neighbors. Um, uh, but in 2008, there was a there, there was a clash, a very small one, but one that uh, left a very bad taste and, and, and prisoners and things. So there has been very tense relations with Eritrea, including since the uh, paper rapprochement between Ethiopia and Eritrea in uh, in 2018. Um, so uh, Eritrea is important for Djibouti, uh, not least because the port of Assab which used to be the key port for Ethiopia, is in the long term potentially a rival to uh, Djibouti, but currently is not because of the situation. And as Anet said, it's actually uh, partially um, has a position in terms of the military configuration because of the United Arab Emirates. Djibouti's relationship with uh, the various Somalias that uh, Afiari has uh, mentioned is also complex. I mean, it, it shares a border with Somali land. And um, the, the, yeah, there are good working relations with Somali land politicians. I mean, uh, partly on a practical basis, it's rather important for Somali landers because you travel in and out to the internationally unrecognized Somaliland through Djibouti. Uh, and there are also all sorts of other ties of medical care, education, families, and things like that. Uh, there are some significant rivalries as well, um, uh, including in relations with uh, uh, the Gulf states, which I'll come back to a little bit later on, perhaps. Um, and in particular, the UAE and Dubai and uh, Dubai Ports World, the, the, the ports provider. Um, but clearly, well, just on Somalia, uh, I mean, Djibouti is a player in, 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 in 
the Federal Republic of Somalia's politics in several different ways. I mean, it has contributed troops to AMISOM, so that's uh, one important aspect uh, and is an important part of the projection of, of Djibouti's kind of uh, diplomacy more broadly, both in Africa and internationally. But clearly, the most important relationship uh, in the region for Djibouti is with Ethiopia. Uh, it is the gateway uh, and conduit for all of Ethiopia, well, more or less all of Ethiopia's foreign trade. The um, renovated Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway, that is the key Chinese uh, infrastructure project in the Horn, uh, links Addis to Djibouti. And it is because of the renovation of the railway that China has invested so heavily in Djibouti's port infrastructure as well. I mean, it's a quarter owner of um, the Port Authority. It has a new major um, container and general purpose port uh, in Djibouti as well. So there are really important economic ties with Ethiopia and that translates into uh, often yeah, yeah. tense but quite substantive and complex political ties between Djibouti and Addis but also with Ethiopia's uh, Afar and Somali regional states, as well as the sort of city-state administration of, of Hara and Diradawa. David, um, can, can, you mentioned Assab in Eritrea as being a, a port that uh, could become a competitor port. Can you make that explicit and connect that to, to the, 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 the issue you were talking about, uh, Ethiopia? Sure. I mean, it's a hypothetical situation at the moment, but I mean, Asab used to be, along with Masawa, the main ports of entry for uh, Ethiopia's imports and then uh, ex and exit for, for exports, uh, I mean, historically. But the war that Annette referred to from 97, 98 uh, closed those ports, and that is actually partly uh, why Djibouti has such a prominent profile as being really uh, almost a quasi-monopoly of, of, of um, merchandise trade into Ethiopia. Uh, there was quite a lot of talk, and it's mentioned in the chapter of mine in, in, in the book, uh, once peace was sealed between Ethiopia and Eritrea, that Assab would be rehabilitated. Uh, and indeed, there was Arab money put aside for that. But the reality, as I'm sure Annette will touch on, uh, is that nothing has happened. So uh, at the moment, there is no threat uh, commercially from Assab. And indeed, given the uh, massive investment in Djibouti's infrastructure and a huge new free trade zone, again, Chinese uh, funded, um, there is little prospect in the medium term, I would say five to 10 years, that there would be much uh, real commercial rivalry. Thank you, David, for this. I, 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 um, I'd like to um, mention again your chapter in the report because our choice also to uh, stress, in a sense, the relevance of this small country we, we, we um, led us, in a sense, to uh, place that chapter very early in the, in the report because we wanted to draw attention uh, to this country that is uh, very little known compared to others uh, in the region. Um, thank you for that. Um, Afiare, back to you. Um, in terms of regional relations, what are current developments in, in Somalia? Uh, again, uh, what has been, if any, uh, the impact of the even the war in Tigray, which is not uh, bordering Somalia, but uh, possibly did have some uh, indirect effect uh, in the country. And more generally, uh, how are external relations affecting uh, developments in Somalia? Um, thank you, Giovanni. Here, actually, uh, I think your question is generally uh, the relations between Somalia uh, and Ethiopia. And uh, I think this is uh, very complex uh, and, 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 and it requires some contextual, uh, uh, at least some, context, some context for those people who are watching here. Uh, so Ethiopia as a state and as an empire prior to that has had uh, strategic interests in the Horn of Africa. It has been actually expanding towards the East uh, for the last century or so. And for that, uh, so the lowlanders, both Oromos and Somali ethnicities were actually trying to rebel 
and, and, and to resist those, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, occupation is coming from the Abyssinian side of, or the Highlanders. So for quite a while, there was, uh, I mean, rivalries based on ethnicity and religion, but uh, empire, uh, Ethiopian empire through Menelik and uh, through uh, Haile Selassie actually pushed towards the east and captured a good chunk of the Somali peninsula. That as a is actually the whole idea of Somali nationalism and what many call uh, irredentism actually was a, a result of that. So we need to understand that. Keeping that in mind, uh, during the, the Somalia's state uh, uh, in the 30 years of 1960-1990, there were two major wars between Ethiopia and Somalia uh, on 1964 and 1977. And in both cases, uh, uh, the, 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 the essence of the conflict was more on the territorial conflict. Uh, eventually, when Somalia collapsed, then Ethiopia got the upper hand and uh, it, it exported uh, it is governance structure. The ethnic federalism in, in Ethiopia became clan federalism in Somalia. And eventually Ethiopia's uh, grand project or grand uh, strategy, which was more like, I mean, accessing the sea corridor. Uh, during Haile Selassie, the, 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 uh, the rationale at the time, at least he was uh, expressing, we need a federal, uh, Horn of Africa, so both Eritrea and Somali lands, all of them belong to Ethiopia. That was the narrative he was trying to sell to the international community. It did not succeed. But the overall, I mean, uh, motivation behind that narrative was to get to the sea. Uh, when actually uh, also this during the Derby, it continued. And eventually uh, during the ethnic federalism project of the Tigray, uh, or, I mean, the, the EBRDF, uh, or even Tigray led EPRDF was also pushing towards that. So whether they, ad, I mean, advanced it that we own this part of the land or whether they advanced it that, oh no, we need a weak and friendly Somalia in order to access uh, the seas of Somalia or now uh, whether the centralized authoritarianism of Abi actually uh, pushed in. Here we see a trend at least uh, from uh, how we, pre we presented in the paper, where we are arguing that yani, in, 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 in an essence, if Ethiopia is needed, if Somalia needs to catch the cold, yani, that, that's what it became. So when, when you look at the uh, current Ethiopian-Somalia relations and rise to Abia, uh, there were three implications. Uh, one is the, uh, I think the first uh, would be the tripartite integration which is that Abia and Formaggio and Apawarga were more or less pushing and saying that we are trying to become more or less one big, uh, I mean, economic block at the expense of Djibouti, at the expense of Kenya, at the expense of, I mean, other, I mean, IGAT countries. So this actually uh, became a very controversial project where many Somalis questioned and said, hey, what is going on? Why, why Djibouti is not in? Why Kenya is not in? Why Sudan is not in? What, what, what is going on? So this became a very, very divisive project. And second, actually, uh, is this uh, model, uh, I don't know, uh, at the moment, I'm sure you covered it in the Ethiopian event when you were talking about it. One of the essences of the problems now between Tigray and the uh, center in Addis is the nature of the governance model. What kind of federalism, if any, or what kind of decentralization? And uh, Abiy is not happy with so-called ethnic federalism, and he's trying to come up with some other form uh, where, I mean, uh, many are calling it centralized authoritarianism. And in that, actually, Formaggio seems to have picked up some sort of that, where he, he, he even got some help uh, from the Ethiopian troops in Somalia. And there were several incidents, uh, both in Kismayo and Baidoa, where uh, more or less Ethiopia was trying to help uh, install Formaggio's wishes in those regions. And this actually had also a very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, controversial impact, at least I would say, or controversial issues uh, within the Somali elite. Finally, 
uh, Ethiopia's uh, involvement in Somalia is further complicated. Uh, it, it has complicated the relations between Kenya and Somalia. So now you see that uh, Kenya and Ethiopia, which used to have a common agreement against Somalia, are now uh, having their own proxies uh, when it comes to Somalia. Juba land with Kenya, and then uh, the center of the Somalia's uh, national government more or less becoming a proxy of the Addis Ababa. So this actually uh, also has had uh, another negative impact in Somalia. Thank you. Thank you, Afiara. Very complex picture. Um, Annette, back to um, Eritrea. Um, again, in terms of regional relations, Eritrea has been mentioned already, both by uh, David and uh, by Afiare. Um, what about uh, regional relations from an Eritrean perspective, the, the, the current evolution of what's going on in the Horn uh, in terms of uh, this specific country and regime? Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry to say I cannot lighten the mood because I think what we've seen in 2018, you know, when the rapprochement was there, when the when the peace agreement was signed in, um, in, in Saudi Arabia, there was a lot of, again, enthusiasm and hope um, on the side of the Eritrean population, on the side, of course, also on the Ethiopian population, exactly, David um, alerted to this, because of the, the idea that finally Ethiopia could have more of you know of a choice not to be reliant only on on Djibouti in terms of their com commercial uh, engagement and and port, but having uh, access to Asap and to Masawa um, as ports. And if if we look you know if we look in in this agreement, um, then basically maybe the frustration was already in there because the agreement was never really shared. We don't the, the people in in Eritrea or in Ethiopia really did not know exactly what the agreement meant. However, the narrative was that there will be, and Afiare was referring to this, there will be a regional economic integration, uh, economic um, alliance between Eritrea, Ethiopia, and, and Somalia, and that this would bring, um, you know, prosperity. And of course, for the Eritreans, um, the, the, the possibility to to move. Um, so for the first, for the only three months when the when the border was opened, Eritreans could move even without their identity card. They could move into Tigray, they could move into Ethiopia. Um, and it was basically a threat to the to the um, to the ideology of uh, of of uh, Isaias of Vorki, um, because it showed that there is not the big neighbor that is you know waiting to attack, but that this big neighbor was actually accommodating more than hundred thousand Eritreans um, in in the camps and but also welcoming Eritreans. Also, the Tigrayans were welcoming Eritreans, and they were not um, you know the bad neighbors that that one needed to have. Um, uh, never-ending national service and uh, and all this for so the beginning was positive but then really nothing followed I mean there were talks about infrastructure um, projects building building roads to the ports of Assab um, opening the borders in in terms of you know for for trade for for trade from from Ethiopia coming into um, into Eritrea having exchanges you know having the telephone lines reinstalled having the flights reinstalled having a prosperous um, integration of, of these three states and as um, Afiari already mentioned what happened and what we see right now even more clear since the war in Tigray begun is that it's becoming much more of an Isaiah's called it I think one time Cushitic axis or Cushitic alliance where it's an alliance of author increasingly authoritarian leaders it's not the states it's not the countries it's really three leaders um, where the the question of the nature of state and the, the nature of the social contract is not discussed anymore um, but is imposed and that's something that is clearly coming from from Eritrea because that's the the leadership style that we've seen there for many many years so maybe the second part that is important in in the peace agreement was that it was possible um, this peace agreement between Eritrea and Ethiopia was possible because basically the main um, the main opposition or the main let's say, enemy was not in power in Ethiopia anymore. So when the peace agreement was signed, and basically this year in 2020, in January, when the summit happened, um, President Isaias Afurki said clearly that, you know, it's 
it's it's over for for once and forever uh, the game is over for the tplf and we see this happening right now or we see this really evolving right now in the war in, in tigray um that abi ahmed is relying partially on, on Eritrean troops. And so there is an encirclement on the TPLF from uh, government troops in Ethiopia, but also the Eritrean troops um, to basically get rid of TPLF because the uh, TPLF for Abi Ahmed is the contesting point where he's bl now blaming basically um, everything what, what went wrong in the last two years. Um, you know, all the all the ethnic tensions, all the massacres that happened in the last two years, long before Tigray started, he's blaming on the on, on the TPLF, and so is um is is Isaias Afwerki. So basically, he has back his raison d'être. He has back the the idea of you know rallying his people behind him um, to fight to fight the TPLF to the end. Um, but what has not translated was the hope for the population on both ends. So what we hear now increasingly is a questioning in Eritrea, why are we fighting this war again? Yes, we don't like the TPLF, but what is it? What is the benefit for us? I mean, we haven't seen development. We haven't seen freedom. We haven't seen an opening of the country. We haven't even seen anything coming from this alliance. Um, you know, there is no economic cooperation. There is not even more stability. The only thing that we see, and we also see from outside is, okay, Somalis are trained in Eritrea and they even apparently been used in, in the war in Tigray, um, but that's not helping the Eritreans to overcome, you know, the economic um, challenges they have. And it's also not stabilizing the region. So I think these are issues that are coming to the fore and are also coming up more and more from, from various regions inside Ethiopia, where yes, you know, a, a huge number of, especially the young people did not like the, the leadership of the TPLF. Um, but they also don't like uh, the leadership of, of Eritrea. So, I mean, I think what is happening, what we see right now is, and this is what I said before, Isaias hasn't changed much, but he's now becoming an architect and a leader because the war in Tigray is ultimately, if it's dragging on, more and more people will ask questions on Abi Ahmed because there is freedom to ask questions so far. Um, so it's weakening Abi, but it's not necessarily weakening Isaias or only, you know, he can still handle it in the way he's, he's ruling his country. And maybe lastly, the, the relationship between um, Eritrea and, and Somalia and, you know, Afiara was referring to what, what we see right now in terms of Jubaland and, you know, having Jubaland as basically their, their Tigray move, uh, moment. Um, but of course, there's a long relationship be between Eritrea and, and Somalia as well. Somalia was hosting the ICUs, the, uh, the, the Islamic courts um, in, in, from Somalia in, in 2006 when, when Ethiopia was invading Somalia. Um, and, you know, the, the UN had for until 2017 a panel of experts looking not only into um, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, but also into how Eritrea is supporting Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Um, so there was a long-standing relation, not because Eritrea had an interest in supporting uh, jihadist movement, but an interest in basically weakening um, Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia as their neighbors and, and uh, the state building effort in, in Somalia. So I think the relationships from Eritrea have not, in the region, have not shown to be stabilizing relationships so far. Um, but because of the dependency that we see right now, Abi is depending on, on the Eritrean forces and Famajo is more and more depending on everybody else in the region. Um, Isaias can, is, you know, is gaining uh, leadership you. weight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. And with this, we completed our, our second uh, round of the, of the table. Thank you very much. Let me, before we start our last third round, uh, of interventions, uh, invite our audience again to, um, to you, can, you can ask questions if you want via uh, Facebook, via YouTube and via Zoom. We are collecting them already. And in a while we'll uh, spend uh, um, the, the last part of our uh, meeting tonight uh, trying to address them. Uh, back to David. David, um, a number of international actors have been, uh, David, I can't see you. Can you, can you please switch on your video? Um, Sorry, yeah, we're coming. Okay, that's great. 
Thanks. Um, a, a number of international actors have been mentioned uh, very briefly uh, already in, in your uh, interventions. Uh, the US, uh, China, um, uh, Gulf states. Um, can you tell us a bit more uh, about uh, international external influences uh, in uh, Djibouti? Sure, I'll try and be really quick because we're going to run out of time. So I guess there are four um, obvious components. Uh, one, the European component. I mean, we shouldn't lose sight of France and France's presence there, nor the fact that the EU has such a big investment and presence uh, there. Um, but that's relatively straightforward. Um, the second of the four which we've barely touched on, uh, has got to do with Djibouti's relationship with uh, Middle Eastern states as a whole. I touched on it right at the beginning, but it's had a particularly complex relationship with the United Arab Emirates and, and Dubai in particular because of a um, massive legal argument over um, container port, uh, which ultimately has resulted in uh, DPW, Dubai's uh, global shipping and logistics company of being expelled from Djibouti. And there is a major um, dossier, which uh, yeah, is, is complex and we won't go into now, uh, but is unresolved. And it does have a significant impact on other aspects of international relations. Then we have the United States. Djibouti is host to AFRICOM uh, and is likely to remain host to AFRICOM uh, I think the lease will almost certainly be renewed when it comes up in a couple of years' time for another 10 years. And, you know, AFRICOM is there for a whole range of issues that are not just to do with the Horn of Africa. Um, it's as much to do with the U.S.'s global projection into the Middle East and Indian Ocean as it is to do with Somalia or Yemen or ties with other African countries. So that's the third of my four components. And then we come to China. I mean, there is so much focus on China's presence in Djibouti because of the naval base and its unprecedented nature um, and its role in the projection of Chinese image as well as power. Um, but I think there are also some misconceptions about China's role in Djibouti. I mean, the base is relatively small. Uh, it is actually uh, playing exactly the same function uh, with the same rationales used as the other major states' bases, that's to say anti-piracy, the need for a logistics center to serve maritime activities, um, as well as the kind of war games and practicing uh, uh, in the hinterland of Djibouti, which uh, all the powers are engaging in. Um, but there is a symbolic importance of Djibouti in relation to its status as a hub on the maritime Silk Road, Xi Jinping's kind of master project uh, framing the expansion of Chinese naval power in particular. So both internationally, but also it should be said domestically in, uh, in China itself, then Djibouti has a, an unusually prominent uh, profile. So, yeah, that's an overview uh, of, of the key aspects of international relations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I also uh, know that you will have to go in a few minutes. You'll have to leave us because your students are waiting you for, for, a, for a lecture. Uh, so we'll probably won't have time uh, to, uh, for you to address uh, some of the questions we have. If you're still there, uh, as long as you can stay there, uh, that's great. Otherwise, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for your contribution. Yeah, thank thank uh, you to you, Giovanni, and the others as well. Thank you. Um, now, um, again, I, I'd like uh, Afiare, you, Afiare, and Annette to be a bit shorter in this um, uh, last round, so we can have a, a few spare a few minutes for for the questions. Um, Afiare, again, in terms of uh, external, extra-African relations, um, what are the key points concerning present-day Somalia? Thank you uh, again. Uh, actually, in terms of the Middle East uh, and Somalia, there are too many actors there. I won't go into uh, each uh, actor and what they are pursuing. But what I can say to you is that uh, since Somalia is a, or has been a collapsed state for some time, uh, there has not been foreign direct investment coming to Somalia, and Somalia has been isolated. So when Turkey 
started uh, or Turkish airline to start flying to Mogadishu and there were a number of activities and infrastructure thing at least Somalia reconnected to the world so I think Turkish uh, an initiative or Turkish engagement of Somalia has opened doors uh, otherwise I mean in terms of the Middle Eastern countries they have been sending some help in terms of uh, humanitarian assistance during the famine in 2011 and 2000 uh, I mean even 16 lately so in that it's okay in terms of where it is harmful is that uh, Somali politicians are more like rent seeking and they try to get some cash in order to purchase the seats and that has been actually uh, problematic for uh, for the country's uh, political uh, at least the political processes as a whole uh, it became obvious now that if you have uh, uh, i mean money and the money usually coming from uh, outside the country mostly from the middle eastern countries then that means you can purchase even the presidency and that is really a problematic thank you thank you um Annette, uh, your uh, closing intervention, again, yes. in terms of um, uh, external uh, extra-African uh, influences. Thank you, Giovanni. I think I've said most of it in terms of, you know, the Europeans and the migration, they, they, they had an, or they have an interest or they had an interest, they still have an interest. Um, but I think the, the times of the normalization might be re- configured again, or the question will be asked um, in the coming weeks and months, I think, um, if there is more and more Eritrean influence in, in, in the regional uh, conflicts, if the normalization can go ahead. Um, so I think I would like to speak more about potential changes. And I think that I see a change in the incoming Biden administration um, that they don't see, they will not see Eritrea as a, as a normal uh, partner, um, and I think you know, remaining is is are the are the um, Gulf countries, um, the Arab Gulf countries, and China. China has a you know practical relationship, more of an economic relationship, but of course also everybody uh, right now has an interest in in the Red Sea. Um, Eritrea has two ports, so everybody is looking in into you know what kind of um, what kind of relationships could evolve from this because specifically the growing market in Ethiopia and when when you talk to China um, or Chinese um, they are not looking into next year or in two years but in thirty and fifty years and they're you know Ethiopia is relevant for Belt and Road it's relevant for a growing market and their Eritrea and the Eritrean ports will be essential. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Um, and let me start with you uh, also with the, with, with the question was, with the questions we have received. We have quite uh, a number of questions. Uh, let me start with Jordan Anderson uh, that um, asks, do you see Isaias as uh, trying to raise the political profile of his son uh, Abraham as a possible possible political successor. Yes, but um, I, I'm, you know, my colleagues who are working on the Middle East basically they spend a lot of time in in terms of successor questions. Um, so far, we haven't started to do this in the Horn of Africa, and I would like to leave it there because I think it's too dynamic, um, and I don't see, you know, this kind of monarchic uh, successor um, question really falling in, into place in the much more politically uh, contested um, political marketplace in in the Horn of Africa. So maybe that's my answer to that. Let me let me stay with you for a moment uh, with, with another question. That's somehow sounds rather the opposite of the idea of political continuity with a, a, a family a, a succession within uh, the ruling family. And this question is by Gian Piero Succi. Uh, he says, Somalia faces instability. Eritrea will sooner or later face instability uh, the day Isaias go, uh, goes. Um, Yemen pushes from the, in, uh, from the West um, let me add, Ethiopia too has its own problems, of course. And he and 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 uh, Jean-Pierre Suchi asks, uh, who will stabilize the region? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what he means, whether external interventions or uh, regional powers. But I turn this to you. 
Well, I wouldn't say Eritrea was any stabilizer for the region so far. I mean, I think, you know, the st stability for the region was uh, in the in the longest term always came from from Ethiopia and it's turning now um, hopefully a bit more to Sudan. And I think in terms of, you know, Afiaru was talking about this, the potential split of EGAD. I think what we might see is um, a stronger relation maybe of, of Sudan and Kenya because they, they are left out of these alliances, um, but they have something to offer in terms of um, they have extremely important positions, geopolitical positions um, and and, and support uh, and influence. And so maybe um, the, the region's st stabilization will come more from, from a Sudanese and a Kenyan angle than, than from an Ethiopian angle, because we see Ethiopia really um, looking much more inwards. But Eritrea, I mean, Eritrea has not stabilized the region. Who is stabilizing Eritrea after Isaiah's um, might not be in power. I mean, I think these are always questions, you know, they're very difficult. They they argue as if it would be stable right now. Is it stable um, or is it just very, very authoritarian? Um, so yes, there might be a risk of instability, but I wouldn't call it um, stability what we see right now. Thanks again, Annette. Um, Afiare, a question for you uh, by Camilo Casola of our Africa program. Um, the president of Somaliland, he writes, recently visited Kenya, uh, aggravating tensions between Nairobi and Mogadishu. How much does the situation in Somaliland affect Somalia's system of regional relations? What are the prospect, prospects for resolving the dispute between the government of Mogadishu and the authorities of uh, Agisha? And is there a risk that autonomies in Pantland will also develop into genuine se secessionism on the model of Somaliland? Wow, that is really a big question. And I don't know if we have- Requires a time. chapter. Well, if, I don't know if we have enough time to cover all of these things, but what is happening at the moment is that, uh, uh, and I, I hope we have the time at least, uh, when Kenya, what Kenya is doing is that uh, uh, the, the, the problems actually, the motivation behind it, the whole thing is the maritime dispute that it has with Somalia, which is in the International Court of Justice. So uh, Kenya is using some of the leverage that it thinks it has against the weak Somalia. And one of the leverages was just the recognition of Somaliland. And there were others as well. Uh, the refugee, the Somali businesses, the Jubaland, and all of these things are some cards that Kenya is trying to play against Mogadishu. Uh, in t but in, uh, obviously Kenya has not uh, created the problem between Hargeisa and Mogadishu that, that, has, that has already existed. Uh, and, and the way Mogadishu is responding to this is that uh, it wants uh, to electioneer to Bob, yeah, and this is uh, Formaggi is just playing also a populist politics when it comes to, uh, to to this relationship. And chances are on Sunday when he goes to, uh, I mean Djibouti, he might even say uh, Kenya is partisan, therefore it should leave. Kenyan troops should leave. So I think this is highly politicized uh, uh, a problem. When it comes to Hargeisa and Mogadishu, there are genuine issues that need to be addressed uh, when it comes to whether uh, these two uh, uh, I mean, places will stay together as a one nation or whether they need to succeed. There have been activities that have been going on. The latest took place in Djibouti. It didn't work. And I think it will, uh, there will be uh, other times. What's interesting now is that Kenya is now going, uh, is being closer to Somaliland uh, or close to Somaliland, whereas Ethiopia is going the other way uh, to Mogadishu. And this is fascinating because uh, it, it hasn't happened before. So I think what we really need to uh, look at is, and I, I hope uh, I, the cooler heads and at least the, those people who are more of a, uh, I mean, uh, looking in the longer run would prevail. Uh, if these are not contained uh, in, in, in a more, I mean, peaceful way, uh, it, it will backfire on, on Kenya and also it will backfire on Mogadishu as well. And, and I, I think this, this, this is where we're heading. I hope I have answered it with the two minutes I had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Afiare. Uh, let, let me just use another um, 
two or three minutes uh, to have short answers from you from, for one uh, more question. This is by Andrea Merla, and it touches upon a point that uh, has not been raised uh, in, in, uh, so far by uh, the three of you. Um, water scarcity. Um, he asks, does water scarcity affect political instability uh, in the region? Um, I leave it to you both. Um, Maybe, maybe we can start with Afiara now that he's um, already... Uh... Well, uh, water scarcity in terms of the Horn of African countries, I don't think so. But water scarcity in general uh, is a problematic because we have a recurring drought uh, in the country. But water actually, water politics has an impact because of Egypt and, 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 uh, and, and, and Ethiopia and the Nile project and the whole dam issue. And I think that also is a quite an interesting uh, aspect that we haven't looked at. Uh, Egypt is trying to uh, have a closer relations with South Sudan, with Somalia, with Somaliland, and they've been trying to get a base, military base somewhere uh, in closer to Ethiopia. So I think the water politics is, is playing or can play a role in the future. I live to, uh, by the way, uh, Annette has written a good chapter on Red, Red Sea Connector, and I, I think she can say something to this. Thank you, Afiari. Annette, back to you. Um, Afiari, I think you said it all in terms of the, the Nile waters and the water politics, and I think this is uh, extremely, is, it will become even more essential and, and uh, is not a stabilizing factor. But I would also say that water scarcity might become more of an issue in terms of local conflicts and um, a driver for local conflicts. We see that, we have seen that in, in Darfur, um, and I'm quite sure, in, you know, in, in the, the years to come, with, with less or with the total irregularity of, of water and rainfall, um, water scarcity will, will be a driver. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, preventing conflicts and, and negotiating basically um, rights is not just land rights, but it's also access to water that will be um, increasingly of importance. So um, I leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to the three of you, even uh, though uh, David is no longer here. Uh, thank you to uh, Annette Weber, senior researcher at uh, SWP, German Institute for International Security Affairs. Thank you to Afiare Elmi, associate professor, as I mentioned, at Qatar University, and to David Stein, lecturer in politics uh, at uh, the Beerbeck College. Uh, thank you very much for your contributions. I think it was uh, an extremely rich uh, hour. Uh, it's a very complex scenario. I hope uh, we, we helped uh, our audience to in, in making sense of uh, all that is happening in, or, or, or part, sorry, of what is happening in the region. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Afiare. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it was you. excellent. And thank you to the audience that was with us. Yep. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Yes. Bye-bye. Oops. Bye-bye. I can't <laughs> leave it now. <laughs> Now we are caught up. I think you have to close it, otherwise we will we will not be able to leave. <laughs>